Uh, welcome to the next talk. Hackers, uh, one way or the other. <laughs> Uh, our three speakers have looked into the security of the te uh, telemetrics infrastructure and so this is all about how to access the data and how to protect it from access. Fr uh, so, the, so the left node speaker is um, Martin. He actually spoke to the German parliament about these health systems and we have next in the center Andre Zierlich, who was also an advisor in, in the German parliament to, on this very topic and on the certification of the system. And and lastly, Seaborg um, is also an expert on these matters. So a big round of applause for our speakers. I'm glad that so many of you at this early hour showed up for this talk about the patient's file. I assume that many of you don't actually know what that patient's file is supposed to be. The patient's file is coming, that's for sure. And to just bring you up to date, there will be a short introduction about what the electronic patient file is supposed to be. The electronic patient's file is a digital patient book which for the time of one's life all contains all health data, allergies, health data, blood uh, data, uh, previous treatments and prescriptions, and all in one place. And it's transparent for the patient because the patient alone has insight into the data and they alone have control over the data and, and determine who has access to the data. Using the patient file, patients can administrate the data securely, online, effectively, and all the information is always available in every live situation in exchange with your partners, uh, which in eases the exchange of data with your partners in health in enormously. The electronic patient file from the 1st of January 2020. We network the health service securely, Gematic, the company behind it. This electronic patient's file is not yet another app, not yet another patient's file as we've seen last year, but it is the patient file, the electronic patient's file that is required by social legislation, has to be provided to everyone to use for, uh, for the whole life for storing health data. And that, of course, leads to several questions. For one, we would like to provide a means of storing health data for the time of one's life, which is X-ray images, doctor's letters, laboratory results, and all that is supposed to be administrated in this file, and the patient is supposed to have sovereign control, uh, exclusive control about who has access, so it has to be secure. Can that work? <laughs> no, someone replied. Sorry. Very important, whether it works or not, we have to um, satisfy these requirements. Liability, so violations in individual cases are, cannot be permitted. So if we're thinking about a bank account access where monetary values are dealt with, you may tolerate individual violations, but here each violation is unacceptable. This is what one of the data protection commissions from one of the German states has said, and it's not new that we have high requirements here. Even our health minister, Jens Spahn, has realized this. He said that a particularly data security is the Achilles heel of this project, because if any violations occur, then the acceptance of this application, every new upcoming application of electronic health pr pr services will be ruined and that will th uh, threaten the trust between patient and doctor in, in surgery hours as well uh, if any violations occur. But Health Minister Spahn also says that he wants to speed up the process, hackers or not. 
And because this is kind of ambivalent, we thought we'd give it a closer look. And to understand more closely and evaluate the security, we have to read the 10,000 page specification, which you can all download on the website of the Gematic uh, company, which uh, deals with so that is the specifications by the company. But also, uh, but their own specifications, but also these from all the various institutions that we have in the health sector. So we read all these, not all of them, but we glanced through them, and we then produced this fantastic graphics here to show you how this patient file looks like. First of all, the insured person, of which there are 73 million, has their electronic health card. Most of you will know this, and you have the card and you have an, a device to read it, which may be an NFC-capable smartphone if the card becomes NFC-capable. And with that, over the internet, the patient can access through a gateway an underlying file system. And in this file system, the health data is supposed to be to reside for the duration of one's life, but it's going to be encrypted. And the uh, talk here is about end-to-end -end encryption. And the key to that data is also stored in this filing system. But don't laugh yet, that key is encrypted. It's encrypted, and that is all justified somehow. But the question is, we haven't solved the problem. Where is the key? Where is the key for the key is now the problem. And for that, we have to look a bit further. Through this, we are connected to the telematics infrastructure. And that infrastructure is the central network of uh, uh, to which now 115 doctors, uh, 115,000 doctors of surgeries, but also pharmacies, hospitals, and all other institutes are going to be connected. Uh, they call it a special VPN network with its own trust space. And this institution supplies the following two, two services. The Sec uh, secure the, the, the key generation service one and the key generation service two. These services generate keys for us, and these are authorized keys. So, with our health card, we have to go to these key generation services and retrieve those blue authorized keys by authorizing as authorized people. And we then take these keys, and with that, we decrypt this pink file key and then we can access the data. For the doctor's practice that wants to access the same data to, for example, add new data and a doctor's letter or uh, a laboratory result, uh, so for them, from the other side, it looks quite different, but a specific device for accessing has to be used. Every doctor's surgery is connected to this telematics infrastructure so needs a so-called connector. That's a spe special VPN router with, with special functionality which gives access to this protected network. Work. And while the insured person uses their health card to authorize to this network and get and, and generate their keys, the doctors or uh, will use their practice ID, uh, their health practitioner ID to access the system. So this is symmetric. Both uh, uh, patients and doctors have chip cards which they use to identify and authorize with the system. And to simply uh, to depict the risks in a simplified way, let's just look at the numbers here. We have 73 million insured people with about four suppliers of the patient file, which are currently. Un uh, in the process of development because it's supposed to be uh, available in a few months and there is one central telematics infrastructure and then of course there are 115,000 doctor surgeries, doctor's practices that are connected now and we estimate that ultimately it will be about 170,000 and the processes how these chip cards are distributed are processes run by the central telematics infrastructure and the problem with the key generation service is that the insured person or the doctor will only identify with their card and then receive a key. So the problem is that we are still hearing about end-to-end -end encryption, but the key is no longer under the control of the insured person. So if you can identify, for example, with a successor card, you get access, you get the key, and therefore access to the data. And even the German Authority for Security in, in Information Technology, the, the agency, the federal agency, has said that if the authentication procedure could be broken, then the cryptographic means and the whole data will be accessible. 
And the Gematic uh, company deduces from that that the correctness of the process of issuing the cards is the basic precondition for the secure operating of this service. Now, card issuing process, which means the transfer of a real existing person or a, a legal person, a doctor's practice, into the digital sphere. And to ensure that securely, you have to uh, satisfy the following condition. You have to identify the person, ensure people, doctors, doctors' pay, uh, practices have to be identified securely, and the attributes, whether they are an authorized practice or an insured person with a certain insured person's number. These data have to be confirmed in a legally safe way and, and the handover of the key, the uh, connection from the identity to the key has to be um, securely and, and has to be very verifiable and that makes the system secure because only then will the card be safely and only in the hands of the authorized people. And the Gematic company knows this too, and they talk a lot about the high um, requirements for the identification process. It has to be reliable, it has to be necessary, it has to be, it's, it's a precondition and all that. Now, what kinds of identities are there? We've seen three cards already. We have the uh, insured person's card, the uh, pr practice card with the health practitioner's card, and then we have the connector, this VPN router, and all these carry cryptographic identities in the form of certificates and private keys, which are stored on chips and, pri and cards. And what we did is we looked at the question whether the issuing process is safe, because this is the central point of attack. If we want to attack, if, 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 it's, if the authentication secures the end-to-end -end encryption, then we will attack the authentication process. Is that possible? Right, thank you, Martin. Yeah, I wanted to uh, tell you about how we actually met. So, so last year, or maybe this year, we had there was this problem that this whole infrastructure was um, was really pushed onto people, and people were fined if they didn't uh, implement the system. And I was very upset about it, and. I wrote a letter and, and then basically to solve this issue we made, <laughs> we got to know each other and looked at to the different parts of the system. So if you look at these different um, cards, then so one you, when you want, if you want to have one of these, then you have to go online to one of the different providers. So uh, we chose the one that had um, a form that you can just fill out and you have to provide different data points and these five po data points are the ones that are being actually checked. So the, the ID of the uh, com comp medical company, your birth date, the, the number of the doctor, last name and profession. Um, so this looks like this, and the birth date is the only piece of information that is not included on every receipt that you get from your doctor. So this is the only missing information that's not easily obtainable. And, uh, and, and uh, yes, uh, so birth date is not a big secret. And, and sometimes you also get the um, city of birth. So you can easily just take that information, enter it, and then the KV checks, okay, does this, uh, does this, is this correct? And then we get this, um, yeah, this card, and no, it doesn't get sent to the <laughs> doctor. No, 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 that would be stupid if, it, if the doctor got it. You can actually specify a delivery address. And that's where it arrives. And, and if there's no one at home at the delivery address, you can also spe specify that it should be delivered to the postal office if uh, if the recipient is not there. And this looks like this. 
Um, you have to activate this online. There's another form for this. For this, you need this PIN um, letter. And with this, we could activate the um, uh, pass port. And, and then we'd register it, the card, and we could obtain the basic information of um, patients. What can you do with this card if you want to do uh, evil things? Well, you have unrestricted accession, access to the telematic infrastructure, which means you have circumvented this safety infrastructure, a security infrastructure. And you have access to different applications and you have access to medical records about medications that people take and you, you have access to that and I can in the near future um, receive messages and sign in the name of the doctor that I stole the, his identity from. Um, yeah, and there was also this other talk about PDF forgeries. So where's the problem? So there are three providers and they send out these cards in the same way. So we tested one provider and it was not a big problem to just redirect the card. Medidesign has uh, issued over 80,000 uh, institute passports and potentially there were some um, com compromised certificates that had to be withdrawn. And lastly, um, there was an insufficient specification of uh, these guidelines or of and the Gematic then approved this process and the trust service provider without really looking at the way they worked. But that's just one type of health card. Now let's take the same type, the health practitioner's card or the doctor's card. If you apply for that one, you need personal identification before that card will be delivered. Do you? No, you don't. Because there is the so-called bank ident procedure, which I'm going to explain shortly. Uh, briefly, a doctor will at some point go to their institutional bank, their professional bank, which is the German uh, pharmacists and, and medical practitioners bank, open an account there or just show up there and, and, and uh, show their personal ID, their document, document, and then they will have passed the first stage of this identification procedure and an attacker will now go to one of these trust service providers, Medisign for example, will enter the data of that practitioner and the bank will say, yes, we know that person, we have an account for them. And the um, doctor's chamber will say, yes, we know this person, this person is registered as a practitioner of, of some kind. What does Medisign then do? They will issue the, the card and deliver it. Again, uh, delivery to some uh, specific delivery address, uh, possibly a separate one, and the PIN letter will be sent to the same address if requested. And this way we could again online uh, activate this card and receive a valid user certificate. And that requires a signature, and I've just said where you get the doctor's numbers from, the doctor's signature will be there too, if you can read it at all. In many cases it will be, such as postal pickup, pickup and post office, the original doctor's signature will not be uh, stored anywhere, so you, you can't really read a signature anyway, that's not anyone's name. So it will be quite easy to imitate this. Again, where is the problem? 
There are two uh, providers and four verification procedures, post-ident and chamber-ident, are, are okay-ish in terms of the specification. The two procedures where a two-side, two-factor identification takes place are not working so well. And these are the bank-ident procedure and the pre-chamber identification procedure where a two-factor identification will take place. So the doctor will show up, show their uh, identification, and then later on someone will show up and say, oh, hello, I am this practitioner, and there is no way of linking these two identities and, and match these and make sure that the person that is applying online is the one that showed up earlier to show their ID. And at Medicine, 31% of the health particulars cards uh, are obtained this way because it's so convenient. I don't have any figures for the other suppliers. And that gives us to our specialist for the gets us to our specialist for the patient's card. And this way, we, sh we showed how we can easily obtain these two cards by doing some simple identity theft, but there's still the um, health card missing in this. Um, uh, and I googled how to see, get a health card and fraudulently obtained, yeah. And so I will tell you how to do this. Um, so the health card is equivalent to the uh, Institute ID card. Many of you will know this. It's the central key to the telematic infrastructure. And one central question was, is the health card an ID card? Or does it does it confirm the identity of the person, or is it more like a shopping card? Some <laughs> so what would be the consequence if it's not an identity card? So because every doctor knows their um, patients, so why would it matter? And, and before the health card, there was this uh, electronic health card, and it was mainly used for billing, and this way the doctor could send the health insurances, the medical bills, but with the health card, it's, it's equivalent to the institute and medical professional cards. And in the context of digitalization, more more work and more more yeah more service is done in the context of electronic uh, processing in also in legal terms uh, paragraph 291a and even the location where where the patient um, uh, pledge to donate their organs um, will be saved. And of course, it will be used as the central key to the patient uh, medical data folder. And there are also additional applications, for instance, uh, like direct health insurances that don't have any uh, offices for uh, where patients can go to. And in and Damn it. Even in individual cases, it will not be possible to access the data. There will be receipts, and in those receipts, there'll be a statement which the, what the health insurances have uh, paid in the last 18 months. And, uh, and here we come back to what Martin said. The identity of the person who's affected has to be determined in advance before social data is being transmitted. And this is quite different, what you might know from different areas. In other areas, uh, it might be sufficient to determine afterwards that something went wrong and then corrections can be made like if you have withdrawn too much money it can be uh, re corrected but 
with, when you transfer medical data, you transfer knowledge. And once, and once, uh, yeah. So the the knowledge about what kind of treatments pe people got, what kind of medications, you can't return this knowledge once um, it falls in the, the wrong hands. And therefore, we talk about different different threats or different. Uh, problems that occur when data data leakages happen, and therefore it's important that it the data must be protected so that even in individual cases it cannot happen that that data gets lost. Um, so which means that these procedures have to be absolutely watertight, that this information cannot be obtained by legal means. And because it's such a central element, right from the beginning, um, when the architecture, the safety, uh, security architecture for this was designed, that the safety level was set very, very high, even higher than financial systems. And it was also determined that identities that um, are used for these digital certificates have to be as high on the security level as these digital certificates. Uh, and then it was determined that the old uh, that the old procedures that handed out the old cards, that these procedures are no longer sufficient or sufficiently secure. And if, for instance, someone lost their card or if they changed the health insurance provider, then a different, a, then a, a different procedure had to be in place to ensure that the new card would have the required security level. And, and of course, in the last couple of years, people focused a lot on the technical um, requirements, but there are still the organizational procedures that had to be taken care of. And in the year 2016, the CDU pa parliamentary party has um, has given a talk. So by Kauda said that there is, if there's only one in one single um, accident with the medical data, is sufficient to remove the trust that people have in the um, medical system. And therefore, it is absolutely essential for the success of the system that the security is watertight and correct and so that it's very important to Kauda that the people um, accept this system. So we take took a closer look at this. Martin said that um, the topic um, was something that he dealt with several years. So I looked at the years when I managed to use very simple methods to um, get um, health insurance cards. So 2014, 2015, 2016. Yeah, last year I didn't do it. Um, so it's like... Yeah, again this year so it's really easy to get these easy to get these cards and the attack scenarios that we used do not differ by much and usually it's enough to just give a call to the health insurance and say hey I moved and then they sent me a new card and I did this for several years and now things got have gotten more complicated and now to obtain a new card, then one way is to change the address. 
So there are two main attack scenarios. So you could either change your address through the insured person or changing the address through the employee employer. Yeah. And and this data is being trans transmitted by the employer. Um, there is so from the employer from the employer to the social security provider, and the data that comes from the employer to the social insurance provider uh, is assumed to be correct and valid. Also, you have to take keep in mind or consider that uh, if you look the respective guidelines, if you read the respective guidelines, you will find that identity, the identity, um, the institution confirming identity has to have has to have education. They have to have a, has to have a security concept, and it is automatically assumed that an employer will have all that, and we. <laughs> We stepped away from we, uh, we stepped back from from taking this kind of attack and focused on uh, address change as an individual. And we looked at how the AOK, the the most the Hessian yeah the Hessian AOK does this. AOK being one of the the largest statutory health insurance provider. And what are the guidelines that they have? And here you can say for. Here you can see that for data protection reasons to prevent abuse from third parties, the address change has to be transmitted either in a letter or fax with, an, with a signature or in a scanned letter with a signature which is then emailed. And the gain in security by scanning in a letter is small. <laughs> or none. And it's not only enough to change the address, that it can change the address. No, online, uh, you can you can actually change your address online and order a new insurance card in the same process as well. So you, you have a very simple means of sending an email here with a non-binding kind of letter, and then a few days later, to that new address, a new, a new health card will be delivered. And this health card, as I said, is the central point of access to the whole telematics infrastructure. So that one weak point is the, is the address change procedure which did not comply with security requirements. And what has to be added here, can you go back one slide, please? Um, we have the statement by the health minister that this telematics infrastructure has to be introduced because fax is so insecure, right? Or at least that it is more secure than fax. So that brings us to a press release, and doctors wrote that the telematics infrastructure is safer than fax, right? If you really want that, okay, you can agree to that. But the funny thing is, uh, when Christian uh, applied for his new card, he sent a fax. Now we have a statement by the another statutory health insurance provider, AOK again, but from a different part of Germany, from Rhineland Palatinate, and they said that uh, in the sense of custom-oriented processes okay. with a trust relationship, post registers have to be considered as valid. Okay, you can say that. And the, this institution from, from the state of Rhineland Palatinate said that uh, an access to health data required an, a previous identity verification. We know that from next year, access to health electronic health data is supposed to take place. Not one of you has gone through an identity, ver identity verification with their health insurance provider. And this query to Parliament was... Uh, and this was a question that the uh, uh, TV station ZDF uh, handed in to the health ministry, and, and the response was, well, the health insurers weren't even complied to, to close the security gap, but the answer was they knew that in advance, and this was as early as 2015, and nothing has changed yet. Okay. 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 Good.
We have so many slides, right, regarding the identity verification process for the health card. We've said that the process, that the health card includes a, a, a constitutes a limited proof of identity. What is this? 60 percent? A limited identity proof of identity does not exist. A PIN doesn't change that either. You either prove your identity or you don't. And to have this, this card ready for use, it has to be secured with a, an orderly identification, proof of, identi proof of identity. If this, okay, I'll just have to step forward. I have so many things to show, sorry. Uh, okay, we'll keep the rest for the Q&A and move to the last part, which is the connector, and then come back to the overall uh, bottom line. That, um, so you could accuse us, uh, tell us that we've only looked at part of the technology and obtained part of the technology and, and the centerpiece, as it's been called, the connector, this beautiful device, which links doctors' practices with the telematics infrastructure. To look at that more closely, of course, you have to order it and obtain it. And normally you can only get it in a package. It's very expensive, about 2,000 euros, which is not the amount that I wanted to spend as a hobbyist in IT security. But we found a supplier that will sell the connector individually. And the procedure was rather simple. It's just a fax to the company. And then it took a bit of time, serious, uh, come on, three months delivery time, uh, that will give you a one-star rating. Uh, Okay, then this connector uh, was delivered through the very safe TNT delivery chain to a trustworthy person, of course, always. That image was from the Leipzig uh, conference center where we are now, if you're watching from outside. Um, now, the central security function of this telematics infrastructure is depends on the security of the issuing of these cards. And we've seen that all the issuing processes for any type of card are worthy of improvement. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, for the first time, this, uh, uh, first, this means that the huge promises that were made aren't really worth a lot. And all they weren't very honest. Uh, these promises that we would have a level of security that would be unique within Europe. Uh, the association of psychologists that said, oh, the Chaos Commuter Computer Club wasn't able to hack it, now therefore it is secure. I don't know where they get this kind of statement from. They shouldn't just release statements like that into the world. It is very dangerous to make statements like, statements like that. <coughs> The health ministry, the federal health ministry, is of course absolutely convinced that it's secure, and we all know that there is no absolute security, and this is echoed by others. So if you communicate something that is supposed to be useful, please uh, also point out the risks and talk, don't talk about absolutes. Say that something can happen and that you have access, assessed the risks and that you are prepared for things to happen, that you can mitigate the risks, that you can uh, mitigate the damages uh, so that the use of the patient can be protected and that is completely missing in this uh, discussion that is dominated by absolutes and saying we are worldwide, we're the best in the world and we are absolutely secure. And we've seen, uh, maybe we're a top in Leipzig, maybe not, but the mistakes that we've seen here, they are not new. The federal printers have known for years They've, they've been publishing it in, in their own expertise uh, concerning their own products, that the telematics infrastructure isn't that secure. The German printers say, the, the federal printer, printing agency says that, says that the delivery, the issuance of these secure cards isn't that safe if it is sent by post. Uh, you, can own, you just need to for, uh, ask the postal service to forward your mail to another address and then you can receive these cards anywhere. 
So if the knowledge is there, where is the responsibility? And we know that it's not just about the patient's file and, and, and the, the services that are accessed uh, that we've heard of. There are many, many private suppliers that want to use this infrastructure to talk with their health practitioners, to talk with patients and identify them. And that, of course, won't all work if even the basic infrastructure isn't so corrupt. So the idea is nice. But then you have to do it right. And that gets us to the positive aspects before we get down to the final bottom line. Because we have to say that there are some positive axes and we, I want to hand back to Andy for that. And we see that the general uh, law, uh, laws um, seem to be realistic and, and we think that there is... We consider it a good idea to use the, the, the state as, as an authority to specify the infrastructure, because without this infrastructure, um, all, the, all the private companies have the same questions, which is how, how, do, how do I achieve that I bring real people who are legal entities who are who have medical records who 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 do i manage how do i manage to bring them into the med, uh, digital world um and and this is and this central element of an identical a uh, digital identity this is quite challenging and and as a necessary measure to um, prevent risks and damage, um, the GMATIC has um, made ha some good decisions to reduce the attack surface and and also to to dis to have measures to limit damage if um, a provider got compromised and and also defining that the level of protection is sufficiently high so that it's really like not like a payback card. And we also saw that the health card is an ID card and it must be treated that way. And, and it's really an organizational process to, that have to be um, admitted, approved, and, and the people who are affected by these processes have to have to be protected and we have shown that it should not be done online because you can't guarantee the necessary protection and this will take a lot of time and I had many discussions and there is a certain degree of lack of responsibility because people uh, think about technical solutions but they don't really think about uh, an organizational um, responsibility and th but this is really important because it's the people who exist in the real world and who are not just projections into a digital system that they are protected and we are almost at the end and this is a central s statement and, and so, but this is a good summary um, so these are the central statements in order to create a secure telematic infrastructure you need to have high standards for data protection and security highest protection and um, and it, you need to make sure that there is absolutely no doubt when it comes to the identification of the patients who use these systems and, and we also observe that the identification of the patients or the medical institutions actually does not um, happen when it comes to re retrieving the cards or obtaining the cards and yeah and you see it it was actually too easy to um, find holes in the system and 
Aber für heute haben wir unser Ziel schon yeah, so we had an easy time um, getting our goals accomplished and but maybe next year we will have a greater challenge and then we will report about our success uh, or lack of success next year. Das würde ich mir wünschen für das Jahr 2020. So that's what I wish for for the year 2020. Um, so we want better security in these systems. So we have a bit of time for questions. Vielen Dank, Martin, Christian und André. Thanks, Martin, Christian and André. Lovely talk. If you have questions, please line up behind the microphones or use the uh, online option. There are signal angels. Are there questions from the internet? Yes, there are questions from the internet. Um, Question to Martin. Is it possible to find doctors who are not connected to the telematic system? So that it's only so that yeah, so that there's only honorary um fine. Well this should be better answered by a doctor, so over to Kristen. Yes, there are doctors that have not been connected to, have not connected to the telematics infrastructure. There are several initiatives of doctors that refuse to be connected. And uh, these deductions in fees, they accept, they pay for your data being secure. Uh, I, please Google it. I don't have the exact name. TI free, TE free or something. You'll find it. Uh, thanks for the talk. In the video. Uh, in the, that he showed in the beginning, uh, it was claimed that the patient has full control, but how does this work if the doctor has access to a key? The patient has to give their consent through the app or through the card in the doctor's practice. So the person, the patient will come there and, and, and put in their card, which they have or you will receive it soon. And they, this way they give the doctor access to the data for a certain amount of time, which they can select. And that gives the doctor access. And the doctor uh, will receive a key that is specifically encrypted for their authorization key, and that is uh, stored at in the infrastructure. That is technical. I'm going to go into that later. This is uh, uh, a kind of encryption that is not so common. Yes, thanks for all the work that you did for our society. It's there. Uh, the patient file is supposed to be voluntary. It's an opt-in, at least for now. But there are various expert uh, groups that demand this to be changed to an opt-out because otherwise not enough people will use this and, and uh, benefit from the positive effects. And if you have this patient file and if you have the mass of their inertia, then you want to move over to an opt-out procedure, which has happened in other countries too. I think Austria is using an opt-out and so is Australia. And I think that they were talking about an opt-out in early on. I think the option would be there that it, it, it might be possible that we in Germany will move to an opt-out procedure too. And I would like to point to the fact that I still, I'm still calling for this to remain an opt-in procedure. Um, because if you don't have the time and the expertise to look at this in detail, and, and then uh, the people that change it to an opt-out will have to take responsibility for all that data, which, they, which no one wants to do. So let's stick with the opt-in with the opt-in procedure. Um, I know that from healthcare that there is a big um, overtaxation um, because people can't uh, catch up with all the documentation and all the bills and 
I would like, I have the suspicion that if you don't um, use digitalization, you will have much more overhead with all the paperwork. Um, so do you think that there is a possibility uh, to introduce digitalization that uh, that's is fast but still safe and and that really is not too slow so that people don't have to do so much paperwork? I agree. I too work in hospitals. Uh, uh, sometimes in short-term contracts, sometimes as a freelancer, and through digitalization I haven't really experienced that time is being saved and more time can be spent with patients. There are some minimal improvements, for example x-rays, which normally you would have on a singular piece uh, of a file, they, they can now be sent, uh, uh, but, but the advanced advances are small, the promises are there. If you digitalize you have more time for, pa time for patients, but the fact, uh, uh, the claim that that really shows in the time you can spend with patient, patients, I don't agree with. Um, and independent from this, the patient's file is going to be a services file for the information of the patient themselves, and whether that can have these revolutionary effects, you don't know, and I'm not going to evaluate this or judge this. And uh, there are some very positive effects that have been claimed and evaluated or will be evaluated, but the risks should be made transparent as well. And then you have to be able to, to balance and, and evaluate both sides. And uh, there are some applications such as secure communication between doctors so that they can send letters. That could be implemented quite easily and that would be of a high benefit. So there are applications that are of benefit. But as we've heard multiple times, a single failure will be enough to undermine trust. And what we've done here you should really wonder whether you can't do better than this. And of course, you can do better than this. And that's why we've laid down our suggestions. And and uh, maybe you should start with services that are not so not as critical as the patient's file, such as inter the communication between doctors, and then go forward step by step. And uh, maybe that will work out. Do you support the current online petition? against TE1? The obligation, the, the online petition against the telematics infrastructure obligation, as far as I read it, is not really founded with the arguments that we have given here. Um, we, are, we took a fairly agnostic approach as far as benefit is concerned, and we looked at the risks only. And this petition against the TI obligation, which uh, has several reasons, are more uh, concerned about liability not being resolved, liability questions, and and, and, and the benefit is also disclaimed. And, and you have to leave that perhaps to the experts, and maybe Chris can, Tristan can say something about that. But I think we should move to the next question. I would like to know if you know if there is something in the specification of the handling of the PIN code because I had the experience that there was um, a technical installation set up in a in, in a uh, medical practice and they just shows a very very simple code that is easy to guess. Well, Martin is the one that knows the specification by heart, but yes, I will say uh, no. Uh, in the health sector, as you said, bad passwords are being used and uh, they are put in places where they shouldn't be put and there uh, is a lot of work that should be done about that to get this thought of data security spreading in, in practices and that's what something we are working on too. And I have to say, though, that the requirements are surely there. The high requirements are high, but also those that are uh, placed on doctors. And, and uh, the higher these requirements, the requirements get, uh, then the, the not many people, not many doctors will fulfill these requirements, and the responsibility is shifted then as well. So technology is there, specifications are there, implementation well is lacking. A, a question from Twitter. Is it possible for me as a medical practitioner or as a doctor 
against my identity being stolen. It would be it would be very desirable to have more firewalls built into there, such as if you uh, apply for a card identity, uh, that you then uh, only approve this new identity after some additional verification, such as postal address. You can verify a postal address without showing an ID. Uh, maybe they should send a letter to the original address saying someone has requested an address change and you could do that with the health card, uh, the, the doctor's card. And uh, concerning the patient's file, something like this exists, but maybe a second or third line of defense should be built in so that as soon as, so that a compromised uh, issuing process will not lead to the whole data being compromised. But currently, protections are very hard, very difficult to make. And what you have to call for is that in the application process and the delivery process of these identity documents, a personal presence of the doctor should be required. So at least for once, the, the, these people should go to their medical professional associations and at the, the receipt of the card, they should be present and show their ID or maybe go to the same institution. And the compliance with doctors there is not that high, not as high as it should be. Thank you for Microphone number four, your question. There just one comment uh, about what has been said before. Um, many health data are being sent on DVDs, DVDs because that's apparently safe. And I have actually one question. What is with the basic data exchange or comparison? Does this work or... Um, yeah, does this work? Well, uh, this works is something I do in my daily work. Um, concerning x-rays, DVDs aren't as bad as all these pack servers that used to be open without any password. You just had to know the URL. So you, there's always a worse solution, yeah, and, and, and the new solution does work. Another Twitter question. So does the patient um, folder have a, an, a unique ID? The patients will are identified in the patient's file through their insurance number, and there is a central place that issues these patients' numbers, and we will be able to tell, so talk about this. Every insured person has a lifelong unique ID, uh, insurance number which they will keep even if they change their health insurance providers. So you have a record that is linked to one person, but as we've shown today, that leads to the fact that you are, cannot, be, cannot rely on the person actually accessing this information because the handover process and the identification verification process do not ensure that it's the same person that has access to this, in, uh, this access information. Mikrofon Nummer 1, deine Frage. Spricht aus eurer Sicht irgendwas dagegen, statt der EGK einfach den neuen Personalausweis zu benutzen? Um, do you think the new German ID card would be a better choice than the health card? I think there are several projects or predecessor projects, pre preceding projects uh, about making the ID usable, the general ID usable in the health service. And uh, there was a citizen's portal that used this. So, yeah, the electronic German ID was supposed to be, it was an idea, but, but now we have, uh, the health service have their own public key infrastructure, which is completely decoupled from, from the electronic uh, ID card. And there's a reason for that, because uh, storing these insurance numbers is supposed to be separate, and to change these specifications in such a way that the uh, German ID stores the security access information uh, and, and have this kind of linking between these two uh, is something that uh, has many considerations and the decision was made not to do that and it's not enough to just identify yourself in the health sector and say I'm going to use my electronic identification process to prove my identity. identity. I also have to bring the information, the attribute with whom I am insured and this information with whom I am insured is currently not possible to store on, on the electronic ID, the German ID. Um. Are there any plans that, for example, my dentist has access to the complete folder 
or is it only restricted to the area, to the part that is important to him? Well, yes and no. The original idea was that all the information uh, selectively, you could selectively release to the individual doctor. So the one doctor only knows your venal diseases, the dentist only knows your state of health, of the state of your teeth. But the health minister applied pressure to speed up the introduction process. And because, of course, these processes are of complicated, he wanted to bring it down to an all or nothing release. And what this will lead to, we will see in one year. Uh, we know that the electronic patients file, which will uh, come in 2021, will be an all or nothing access. So you'll have to consider whom you release this information to. And, uh, you know, with some certain procedures such as psychotherapy, uh, this is something that you as a patient uh, as a patient would not go to a psychotherapist and ask them to put in a, an expertise into the patient's file because other doctors would then see it and you have to know that this will not have any negative effects if other doctors don't see it. In, and this rights management is supposed to be added in 2022, but we can't judge this because we haven't seen the specifications yet. I'm sure it's been worked on still. Thank you very much for answering all these questions. Please, a big round of applause for our speakers. And, and uh, thanks for listening to the translation. You were listening to Sebelis.